Hey, 21 days from today, we'll celebrate together the resurrection of our, our Savior on Easter Sunday, and I hope that you're making plans to be here, and I hope you're making plans to bring somebody with you. Uh, and leading up to that, I, I want to start a brand new teaching series today, uh, simply called uh, uh, Red Up the House. Uh, now, some of you, this, this phrase, this word is, is unfamiliar to you. Others of you, I know you're aware of it. I learned the phrase when we lived in southwestern Pennsylvania. In fact, if you look it up in the Urban Dictionary, urbandictionary.com, it says, Pittsburgh Ease 4. And it means uh, to clean, to organize, to get ready. Uh, when we lived there, we heard it this time of year more than any time else. Spring, I, where I grew up, it was spring cleaning. But where we lived in southwestern Pennsylvania, it wasn't spring cleaning. It was redding up the house. The winter had come. The winter had uh, wreaked havoc. And you had to clean everything from top to bottom. And you washed the walls. And you did all this other stuff. You, you read up the house. You, you cleaned. You organized. Uh, you got ready. It really came to mean something personally to, to Autumn and I. Uh, when we found out uh, Autumn was pregnant with our, our first child, uh, there was a couple in the church. Uh, his name was Newt. Her name was Dolores, who would have us over on a regular basis uh, for dinner. And Dolores, she was a great cook, and, and she would set an extra special plate for Autumn. Uh, different china than anybody else got. She would have a glass of whole milk, and not just a glass of whole milk, a pitcher with whole milk for Autumn to drink. And she fixed Autumn extra special things to, to eat and took care. And every time we would tell her, thank you, uh, Dolores' response very simply was, you have no idea how much I enjoyed the opportunity to red up this meal for you, to organize it, to get it ready, to, to be of benefit to you. And so for the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about what does it mean to red up the house, God's house, to get ready for Easter 21 days from now. How do you intercede? How do you invite? How do you invest? How do you invite? How do you really red up to get yourself ready and get other people ready for Easter? But I don't want to just talk about 21 days from now. I want to talk about 1,113 days from now. 1,113 days from now. 1,113 days from now is 4, 16, 17. 1,113. Thanks for asking. There will be a bonus in your check this week. So... I, I got to run that past the trustees first, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> one bonus. One bonus is all. Uh, 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 1,104, 16, 17, April the 16th, 2017 is Easter Sunday, 1,113 days from today. And 1,113 days from today, this should come as no surprise to you because we've been saying over the course of time, uh, the last several years, that we believe God wants us to get to the about 900 people in corporate worship by a certain date. That's the date that we've assigned to that, uh, 1,113 days from now. What in the world do we have to do in those 1,113 days so that God can do what only God can do? Because sometimes in our lives there are those opportunities. What do we have to do so that God can do what only God can do? Now moving towards Easter uh, three weeks from today, uh, we want to encourage you to intercede, to invest, and invite. And I'm starting a new teaching series three weeks from today simply called Bridezilla. And so uh, I grew up, uh, I've been, not grew up, I, I, I've been living in, in a house, of, I guess I did grow up, in a house of women over the last, you know, uh, however many years. And, and, you know, I've watched a whole bunch of these TV shows. And, and so Bridezilla, uh, every time I get to watch one of those Bridezilla shows, you, some of you know the Bridezilla shows, you can kind of shake your head at me. Every time I watch one of those, the only thing I want to shout at the groom-to-be is, run away now! <laughs> Don't marry her! And we're supposed to be the bride of Christ. And you look at these seven churches in Revelation, you've got to wonder, is God saying, what did I get myself into? And so we're going to be taking a look at that, and I hope that you'll be uh, there every Sunday during that teaching series. But that starts 21 days from now. But, but in order for us to do what we have to do so that God can do what only he can do, we, we come to understand that there's a, there's a gap. And the gap exists between our expectations and our experience. Not just in the church, but in your own life. Have you ever had that where, where you've expected, hey, I've expected that I've invested this much time and, and work in, in the company that I'm a part of, and I had expected that I would climb the ladder at least to be here over these five years, but my experience tells me I'm not going to get there, so maybe I start to look for a new job. Maybe your expectation is, hey, we've been married 10 years now, and we thought at 10 years of marriage, man, we would be past this issue and that issue and this thing, and, and my expectation is here, but my experience is here. Maybe I could frame it this way. I've had people tell me this. Maybe you've had people tell you this. Hey, Tim, I... I hope for the best, but I expect the worst. You know anybody like that? Because their, their expectations and their experience, I, I hope for the best, but my experience tells me I'm never going to get the best. I don't deserve the best. I won't get it. And so expectations and experience don't line up. And the gap that exists between there, let's call that frustration. Frustration is the gap that exists between expectations and experience. We see it three days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus back to their hometown. 
And they're headed back to their hometown and, and they are discouraged and the scripture says downcast and their faces are sad and, and, and they're talking about all the things that happened and Jesus shows up by their side and begins to talk with them. And he says, why are you so sad? And they say, well, we're sad because we're talking about the things that have happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, what things? And they look at Jesus and say, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what things? Here come the expectations. We had hope. This is what Luke 24 says. We had hope, expectation, that he was going to be the one who had redeemed Israel. Expectation, experience, but it's the third day and nobody's seen him. My expectations don't match up to my experience. And there's frustration. It had to happen on Good Friday, didn't it? As they watched him hang on the cross. Our expectation that he was the Messiah, the Savior, and now he's dead and we just put him in a tomb. And my expectations don't match my experience. And I find frustration did happen to Thomas after Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room. Thomas said, it's not my experience unless I put my finger right there in the hole in his side. Unless I touch him, my, my expectations and my experience. It happened to Peter a couple of days after the resurrection. He'd even seen the risen Lord. And he's like, I'm just not sure that my expectations and my experience line up. So all I know to do is I'm going fishing. I'm going back to that which I know where I can expect if I put this much time in, I'm going to get this much result. What happens when your expectations don't meet your experience? You know what happens, don't you? You begin to lower your expectations so that there's not quite as much frustration because your experience tells you that's the only way to survive. And I have one point, one purpose of this entire sermon today. And my purpose is that for the next 21 days, for the next 1,113 days, in our community of faith and in your lives individually, this sermon is meant to raise your expectations simply of who God is instead of frustration filling that gap to allow God to fill that gap. Listen to God's word, Ephesians chapter 3. For this very reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. That's you and that's me. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When expectations don't meet experience, what God says, I want, I want to fill the gap is the fullness of who I am. For you to understand me and my totality, that you don't have to be frustrated, that I have some ways to talk to you about your anticipation and your expectation and your participation in my purposes. Then this verse, this is the one most of us know. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that work is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. John chapter 17 this is how Jesus said he brought glory to God on earth. He said, I brought you glory on earth, Heavenly Father, by completing the work you gave me to do. I, 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 got, I got all read up. I organized, I cleaned, and I got ready to do the work that you gave me to do. How, how do you and I do that when we're living in this gap called frustration, when expectations don't meet experience? If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to encourage you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 3. Maybe you brought a mobile device and you want to find it there. 2 Kings chapter 3. Let me give you a little bit of the background. 2 Kings chapter 3. This is during the time of Israel's history of the divided kingdom. Remember under King Saul and under King David and under King Solomon, it was a united kingdom. Israel was one unit, but, but Israel began to sin and, and it was divided into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so you had the king of Israel and you had the king of Judah. And in 2 Kings chapter 3, these two kings, the two kings of the divided kingdom, the, north, the, the king of Israel and the king of Judah, uh, have a problem. There's a third king, a king of Moab, who's supposed to pay tribute to the king of Israel. What he's supposed to give the king of Israel every year, just as a tax, just as a, as a courtesy based on the treaty, is he's supposed to give him 100,000 sheep, and he's supposed to give him the, the wool from 100,000 rams. And the king of Moab decides, this year I'm not going to pay the tribute. He takes the king of Israel off. So he gets with the king of Judah and says, this guy or the king of Moab refused to pay, so here's what I want to do. I want to get another king involved, the king of Edom. Now here's what I need you to understand. Kingdom of Israel's up here to the north. Kingdom of Moab's in the middle, and the kingdom of Edom's down south. So what the king of Israel and the king of Judah decide, if we can get an alliance with the king of Edom, 
We can surprise attack Moab. Moab's going to think we're going to come from the north, but if we can get an alliance with the king of Edom, we can, we can go around to the east and come down to the south and attack from the south, and they'll never see it coming. So they arrange a, an alliance with the king of Edom, and they're going to do just that. But here's what I need you to know. They're not going to take the most direct route from north to south. They're going to go east. They're going to go east of the Jordan River through the desert called the Desert of Edom. They're going to spend the majority of their time walking down a, a wadi, a, a, a pathway, a, a desert, a dry river bed. They're, they're going to spend the most of the time walking down this wadi. It's called the Wadi of, of, of Ashi. And they're going to walk down this wadi, and, and that's what they're going to do. So, so these three kings, king of Israel, king of Judah, king of Edom, form an alliance against the king of Moab. Chapter 3, 2 Kings, verse 9. Here's where we jump in. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. They miscalculated. They had a plan that in order to get down there to Moab, it would take them about six, seven days, and it was hotter than they thought it was going to take. It took them longer than they thought it was going to take. For whatever reason, they're out of water, and now they have a problem. Some of you in your life understand that there's something that God has called you to do so that he can do only what he can do. But the only way you're going to get there is if trouble comes into your life. Because you see, the positive issue, the positive instance here is that, that trouble came. Trouble sometimes the only thing that gets us to turn back to the source. The king of Israel and the king of Judah at this time are not honoring God with their lives. The king of Judah, sort of, but not really. The king of Israel, absolutely not. He does evil in the sight of God. God is not pleased with him at all. And so they don't want to have anything to do with God. And sometimes it's trouble that gets us to turn back to the source. And so now they're seven days. They're in the middle of the desert. Everybody's tired and hungry and thirsty. And they have no water. Has that ever happened to you? Come up with a plan. And you say, this is how I'm going to get from point A to point B. Uh, this is how I'm going to attack this problem. And all of a sudden, you get in the middle of it, and it didn't quite work out the way you thought it was going to work out, and you find yourself in some serious trouble. And sometimes when you're in trouble, the only response that you have, the only appropriate response is to turn back to the source. Let's look what happens. Verse 10. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? The only conclusion the king of Israel can reach at this point is we're going to die in the desert. And this is God's fault. God brought us to this point. Has that ever happened in your life? When something bad happened, you blamed God, even though the reality of it was you weren't living for God when things were going good. But when something turns bad, this has got to be God's fault. We see it all the time, right, with natural disasters. It's God's fault for those 33 minutes in May that ripped the EF5 tornado ripped through my hometown of Joplin, Missouri, and my, my, dad lost, my mom and dad lost their, their home, uh, Autumn's mom and dad lost their home. 160 some odd people were, were killed. That's God's fault. God didn't get any credit for the other 23 hours and 27 minutes when natural disaster didn't happen. When rescue started to take place for the lives that were saved. He gets blamed for the lives that are lost. Has that ever happened to you? When things start going bad, we have the tendency to blame God even though we weren't living for God. That's what's going on with the king of Israel and the king of Judah, especially the king of Israel. He gets to this point in the desert and he's like, why has God brought us here to die? Let's keep going. But Jehoshaphat asked, he's the king of Judah, by the way. Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Jehoshaphat finally said, we've we got to ask God. We've got to know what's going on. Here's what I want to know. Question. What's the greatest need of your life right now? What is it that you need God to do that only God can do? Where is it in your life that you need God to do the miraculous? Where is it? Even if right now the only thing that you can do is blame God for the bad and you weren't living for God and the good, still, what is it that you need God to do? Would you be honest and you just kind of write it down on your teaching outline, just admit it to yourself, this is what I really need God to do. I need God to do this and I believe he is the source and he's the only one. The kings have said the only one that can bring water at this case is God. We're in the middle of a desert. There's, there's, you know, there's no 7-Eleven. There, there's no uh, uh, Speedway. There's no place to go get some bottled water. We need God to do this. What is it that you desperately need God to do on your behalf right now? I want you to acknowledge that need. Then how can you expect and anticipate and participate in God doing that? that? That's what begins to happen. Another question. Who is it in your life 
that you allow a prophetic voice. When things are going bad and you're, not, you're having trouble understanding what the Word of God is saying. Now you need to understand with if you have a relationship with God through faith and trust in Jesus, you don't need anybody else to explain the Scriptures to you because you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will make evident the understanding of the Scriptures. But in those moments when you're not living for God and the only thing you can do is blame God, who is it that is close enough to you that you walk close enough with that you say, if I need to know what God says, that's who I'm going to turn to. Because that's what the kings do. We need a prophet. Now a prophet predicts the future, but a prophet is also the one in your life who simply says, this is what God has to say about this situation. And we all need those people in our life. Who is it? And so the prophets ask, I mean the kings ask, uh, the king, is there not a prophet of the Lord here through whom we can inquire of the Lord? And an officer of the king of Israel answered, hmm, Elisha, he's the son of Shaphat, he's here. He used to pour water on Elijah's hands. Here's what I need you to understand. That's an insult. Yeah, there's a prophet. He's a reserve team guy at best. He'll never make the starting lineup. Oh, he really wants Elijah. Elijah's nowhere to be found at this point. And by the way, the only relationship this guy had with Elijah, he was the water boy. <laughs> he brought him water and washed his hands. Is that who you really want? And I've got to expect that the king of Israel at this point said, absolutely not. I don't want the reserve guy. I don't want the B team guy. I don't want the junior varsity guy. I, I, want, I want the guy in the starting lineup. I want, I want the game changer. That's what I want. Give me Elijah. And the king of Judah says this. No, the word, verse 12, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And they show up at Elisha's place. One of them not happy about it. One of them just hoping that God would say something through Elisha. And here's what they say. Hey, prophet, we've got a problem. God's people are in the desert thirsty. We had a battle plan, and the king of Moab has rebelled, and we've got to attack him. God's told us to do this. We need to attack him, and um, we don't have any water, so we need you to do a miracle. I don't know how you're going to do it. Maybe you're like Elijah. You can call down water from heaven. Maybe you're more like Moses, and you're just going to take a staff, and you're going to strike a rock, and water's going to come gushing out. We don't care how you do it, but give us water, and give us water now. Verse 13 is Elisha's first sermon. And I want to tell you, this is not how they tell you to preach sermons in seminary. This is not a great introduction to a sermon when you want to motivate people. Look what Elisha says in verse 13. Elisha said to the king of Israel, Why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. No, thank you. You didn't want to know what God was doing on the front end. You had no place, you had no, place no room in your life for God on the front end before you concocted this ludicrous battle plan. And now you want me to intervene on your behalf? Go fly a kite. No, thank you. I don't want to be involved in your sin. Again, not a great introductory moment to a sermon, especially when the audience has the ability to kill you. But Elijah has no time for subtleties. Verse 14. What, 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 what Elisha's saying here is basically, God's not just another option God's not your last resort. You need to treat God like he's your only hope. And I am sick and tired, Elisha says, of people like you, king, who just think you'll, you'll call out to God just when times are bad. God's not another option. God ought to be your only hope. The king of Israel answered, No, it was the Lord who called the three of us kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. And Elisha the prophet, I think, is just laughing. King, you don't have a clue. You don't know what God wants. You're the one who's run further away from God and done evil in God's eyes. You have no clue what God wants. So Elisha's sermon continues, verse 14. As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. Elijah doubles down. Check this out. How about this? How about you show up for church faithfully every weekend? And one Sunday, I'm just so ticked off at whatever I'm ticked off about, probably not even you, but I'm just so ticked off at something, I just say, okay, here's the deal, folks. If it wasn't for the fact that I had respect for Pastor Bicknell, I wouldn't have one word to say to you about what God wants. It's only because of my respect for Pastor Bicknell that I even showed up today 
The only reason anything's coming out of my mouth is, is because I have respect for Pastor Bicknell. You know what's going to happen? In a matter of seconds, Pastor Bicknell's going to be the only one sitting in the room. Don't you think? You're not going to like that. The kings don't like it. How can you? You're a king. He has the ability to kill Elisha on the spot. And Elisha says to him, the only reason I'm willing to even entertain this is because of the king of Judah. He puts the king of Israel in his place. Don't make God your last resort. Verse 15. Clint, you want to come on up? That'd be great. This is one of the funniest verses, I think, in all the scriptures. It just cracks me up every time I read it. I would not pay any attention, uh, let me start verse 14. As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. Bring me the harpist. Really? I want music and I want it now. Now prophets, you need to understand, traveled with harpists. And, and they traveled with harpists for, for a couple of different reasons. And one of the reasons they traveled with harpists is because is because when, when music, remember, David played the harp for Saul and it calmed his spirit. So, sometimes, have you ever used music as the opportunity or the thing that begins to, to calm your spirit and enhance your awareness of God's presence? M music may be like this. <laughs> go, harpist. There we go. Just for a moment, you've got to calm your spirit. And before you say, say something else stupid... Before you say something else that you're going to regret, you just know you need to capture your thoughts and you just need, you just need to take a moment and breathe and the thing you turn to is music. Any, any of you got music like that? If I just need to calm down and calm my spirit, man, I'll just, I'll just put on my, uh, in my CD player in my car or, or plug in my, my uh, iPhone and I'll just listen to the great hymns of the faith. Before I say something stupid, man, it just, it just begins to calm your spirit. You ever use music for that, just to, to calm your spirit? You know the other thing music does? Music, music enhances our awareness of God's presence. I think that's why the prophets traveled with a harpist. Music, music doesn't invite God's presence. God is already present. God can't be more present than he already is. Music just enhances our presence. It's why we sing every single Sunday we gather together. Not because our songs invite God's presence. There's already a great worship experience going on in heaven. As angels shout back, holy, holy, holy. Music enhances our awareness of God's presence. And the prophet just, just, just stop. I don't think you're getting to stop for a second. Let me try again. How about this? Wouldn't it be cool if you could travel with Clint and his keyboard? <laughs> right? And you're in the boardroom tomorrow morning. And you've got this meeting that you've been regretting. And you're just going to have to lay it on the line. And this is how it's going to be. And you know it's the right thing. And you've got to do it. But Monday morning when you wake up before you get to the office... 10, 11, 12 emails of people just upset and going off. And now the only thing that you can think is, is when I get in that boardroom, I'm going to let everybody have it. And, and you start down that path, and all of a sudden you, you catch yourself. And before you say one more thing, you regret it's like, bring me the harpist. <laughs> and you just take a minute, and I can breathe. Hold on. How about this one? Wouldn't it be cool? If Clinton, his keyboard, could follow you into your home and you're about ready to have a fight with your wife, or better yet, you're about ready to have an interaction with your children whom you love dearly, but the two of them are about ready to knock each other's heads off and you're going to let them have it and you're about ready to say something and all you want to do is you want to grab them and you want to throw them against the walls. And before you, before you, before you say anything stupid, before you, before you say one thing, you're, you're like, bring me the harpist. And Elisha travels with a harpist because he says, God's going to do something only he can do. And I've got to do what I've got to do, even though I don't want to do it. Bring me the harpist. That's one reason we travel with the harpist. What do you do to enhance your awareness of God's presence? All right, stop. Thank you. Secondly, there's a second reason, I think, that uh, the prophets travel with a harpist. You ever use music as motivation? Two of you, thank you very much. You use music as motivation. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. It's why every team has a pet band, right? It's why every school has a fight song. It's why it's out there. Music, music is motivation. You know, I don't know what it is, the music that motivates you, that you wake up to, man, I just need motivation. And sometimes music motivates, and the, and the prophet knows this, and so uh, there's a difference in me saying this. You can make it. Don't give up. God is with you. No matter what. 
or me saying this. You can make it. <laughs> Don't give up. God is with you. No matter what. You're still not motivated. Oh, there we go. Hey. I'm going to start traveling with a harpist. I'm going to start traveling with a harpist. It's a good deal. Your brother's already asked for a raise. What do you want? And I, 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 I don't know. We can, we, can work, we can work this thing out. So, Elisha says this. Bring me the harpist. And while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha, and he said, This is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. Can I, somebody bring me my prop for me, please? Thanks. If your dad didn't work out, I'm looking for a harpist. Just want you to know. Just, 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 just want you to know. This is what the Lord says. Go dig a ditch. I know, King, you're waiting for water from the rock. I know that you're waiting for water from heaven in a miraculous pass, in, in, a, in a miraculous way. But King, you want God to do what only you can do? Pick up a shovel and go dig a ditch. Make this valley full of ditches. So I've got to ask this morning, what is it that you want God to do that only he can do? But I also need to ask you, what ditch do you need to dig? What ditch do you need to dig? There are some of you in the room listening to me right now who simply say, God, I want you to bless my children like only you can do. And God simply says, dig a ditch. The power of life and death, Tim, is in your tongue. You bless them first. You bless them and let them know they are a blessing and let them know they're covered in your love and in your protection. And then watch me do what only I can do, Tim. You want me to bless them, pick up a shovel and dig a ditch. I was talking with a parent a couple of weeks ago, a very dear friend, and we were talking about digging a ditch in his children's life. And we talked about it the week before, and we talked about, hey, I know your children are wandering away from God, and you're, you're trying to figure this out. Dig a ditch, keep, keep the relationship open, figure out a way to, to still let them know that you love them and you care for them, and dig a ditch and so we were talking about that and he came back to see me the next week and I just started said hey how's that how's that ditch digging going he's like you need to pray for me I'm like why so I've been digging a ditch but right now I'm so angry at my child the only thing I want to do is push him in cover him up <laughs> I appreciated his honesty because sometimes digging a ditch is hard work some of you are saying hey God heal my marriage and God says dig a ditch hey God fix my husband he is the most terrible lousy rotten no good very bad I'm talking to God man that there, that there is God says you want me to fix your husband dig a ditch he doesn't deserve it he doesn't treat you right give him the respect that he longs to have, dig a ditch. Some of you are saying, hey God, fix my wife. And God says, dig a ditch. Hey God, she's the most terrible, lousy, rotten, no good, very bad woman there is on planet earth. God, she doesn't respect me and she doesn't love me. And God, I'll, I'll start to, to love her when she starts to respect me. And God says, hey dude, pick up a shovel and dig a ditch. Like, I don't know how. God says something like this in your ear. Hey, try this. Tonight after work, take her some flowers. Just tell her you love her. And then tell her, hey, we're going to go out for dinner. And oh yeah, take her to one of those restaurants where they actually bring the food to you. And oh yeah, by the way, when you take her out to dinner tonight, put on a shirt with buttons. Let her know that she's worth dressing up for. Let her know that you've looked forward to the day. You want, me to, you want me to fix your wife? Hey, dude, dig a ditch. Hey, God, fix my finances. God says, dig a ditch, pay your tithe. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse and see if I won't pour out blessings. Open every window of heaven and pour out blessings on you like never before. You want me to fix your finances? Dig a ditch, pay a tithe. Hey, God, 
heal me. And God says, dig a ditch called exercise and eating right. Hey, God, bring joy to my life. And God says, dig a ditch. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. You want me to bring joy in your life? Turn off all the music and television shows that do nothing but depress you and make you upset at the condition of the world and open up my book and see if I'm not the God of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Teenager. You know God's standard for you is purity, sexual purity. And it's hard. And all the places that you're tempted and all the things that you're going through. And you want to honor God with every area of your life, including your sexuality. And you say, God, I want to honor you that way. And God says, dig a ditch. Set up some boundaries and some accountability in your life that you will never put yourself in a position where the temptation is too great for you. Dig a ditch. Set those up. The most important decisions you make are the decisions you make before the decisions you make. Dig a ditch. And there are some of you who are single. And the prayer of your life and the heart cry of your life is, God, I, I, wanna, I want a mate. I want, I want a spouse. And God says, that's something that only I can do. And instead of looking for the perfect mate, why don't you look to become my perfect child? Why don't you worry about the things that you can do and love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when somebody else comes along, you'll be able to love them the way they're supposed to love them. Let me do what only I can do and you go do what you can do. What is it that you need to do? My friends, pick up a shovel and dig a ditch. Make this valley full of ditches. What I've discovered in my own life when God calls me to dig a ditch, it's usually not just one ditch. Have you picked up the irony of this yet? They're in the desert. Have you ever dug a ditch? The two of you have dug ditches. Thank you. Two of you playing along with me this morning. So thank you very much. Have you ever dug a ditch? It's hard work. I, I've never dug a ditch in a hundred. I've walked in this desert. That's talked about in this passage of scripture. It was a hundred. I kid you not. It was 113 degrees in the shade that day. I never had to dig a ditch in this desert. I had dug a ditch in August in 100 degree heat in Missouri. I've dug a ditch in Ohio. What happens when you dig a ditch by night or day? It's hard work and you will, anybody? Sweat. What don't they have? Water. You run the risk in digging this ditch that what you need to refresh and replenish yourself will not be provided to you. And God says, you run the risk of dehydration. I don't care. Pick up the shovel and dig a ditch. And you run the risk of trying to love your wife the way she's supposed to be loved and never get anything back. God says, I don't care. You may not get what you think you need for refreshment. Go dig the ditch anyway. It's hard work. You start digging the ditch and there are blisters on your hand. Pick up the shovel and dig the ditch. My friends, what ditches do you need to dig today? If we're going to rent up the house for God to come, we have to expect him to do what only he can do, but we have to dig the ditch that he wants us to dig. You see, when, God's, when, when you're down to nothing, God's up to something. A couple more things. We'll move through this quickly. Look at verse 17 with me. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet the valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and all your other animals will drink. You see what God says? How do we dig the ditch? By faith. You're going to go out into that desert, and you're going to start digging. And by faith, I promise you, the water's going to come, but you're not going to see the rain clouds move in. You're not going to feel the breeze of the storm front move through. You're not even going to see the rain itself. But you start digging some ditch. You start digging some cisterns so that they can hold all the water that I'm going to pour out. But you're not going to see it. You're not going to feel it. Keep digging the ditch because I'm going to act. It's by faith. It's by faith. You see, even when I don't understand completely, I must obey fully. That's called faith. And you're trying to dig a ditch for your children who are far away from God and you're not seeing any movement. You're not feeling any results. You're not seeing anything happen. And God says, keep digging the ditch. Because I'm going to bring your prodigal child home. Because that's the kind of father I am. Verse 18. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> I love that. The thing that you think is impossible, the ditch that you think, the, the thing that you need God to do that only God can do that you think can never happen, God says, this is an easy thing for me. We just go dig the ditch in faith. This is easy for me. Go dig a ditch. Look what he continues to say. God will not just give you the water. He says he will deliver Moab into your hands. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree. 
stop up all the springs and ruin every good field with stones. God says, here's the battle plan. The one you concocted up here to go around to the south and come down, don't worry about that anymore. Here's your new battle plan. You go dig the ditch, and I'm not only going to give you water, I'm going to give you victory. Would you please notice that God speaks about your victory in the past tense? God sees your victory, and he tells you it's yours, even if you do it by faith. Friends, here's what I need you to understand. Evidence comes after obedience. Evidence comes after obedience. God is never going to ask you to do something that he's already given you the power to go do. He gave you the power to go dig the ditch. He gave you the power to bless your children. He gave you the power to love your wife. He gave you the power to give your money. He gave you the power to exercise and eat right. Whatever it is, he's given you the power to do it. And you go out and do it, and evidence will always follow obedience. Look at verse 20. The next morning, about the time for the offering, about time, about the time for offering the sacrifice, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom. And because music is so motivational, I'm going to ask my harpist to stop for just a second. Verse 20, here's the modern day prayer phrase. They woke up the next morning and... Somebody asked me this morning when I played it if I was going to da- dance, and I told them I could give them a prophetic word. No, I would not dance at that moment. You know what they thought was going to happen when I woke up the next morning? Here's a shovel. Go dig another ditch. And they woke up the next morning. Now, there's great debate. Just let me tell you. In 1868... In the region of Jordan that we would call modern-day Jordan, there was a stone found. Some people uh, uh, referred to it as the Moabite stone. Other other people referred to it as the as the Mishnah inscription or the Mesha inscription. It is 2 Kings chapter 3 told from the Moabite perspective. 2 Kings chapter 3 told from the Moabite perspective. They woke up one day and there was water water because they'd been faithful to go out and dig the ditch bottom of your teaching outline I ask you this question big fill in the blank what area of your life does God want to fill with his blessing that thing up there that you said this is my greatest need just transfer that to that fill in the blank God wants to fill that area of your life with his greatest blessing but chances are he's going to say to you first hey go dig a ditch go do what you can do so that I can do what only I can do Go dig a ditch. About 14 years ago, there was a group of less than 100 people meeting every Sunday morning at Bauer Elementary School. That group of people is called Miami Valley Community Church. An opportunity to purchase a building on the corner of Fifth and Park in Miamisburg opened up. We prayed and we thought and we investigated. And we believe that that was what God was going to want us to do. God, we need you to give that building to us. And God said to that group of less than 100 people, go dig a ditch. You want the building. It's about an $80,000 down payment. Guess how much money we had in the bank at the time? None. Less than 100 people dug a ditch. And my friends, that's yesterday's faith. And we're the beneficiaries of it. And God says from the start, when when, when we purchase this building, at the bottom of your teaching outline, you'll see Psalm 126, verses 4 through 6, from the message paraphrase. When, When we purchase this building, when we purchase this facility, this became the prayer of my heart knowing that this would, be, this would be one of the places that God would take us, that God would lead us to a place from which we could change the world. But I love this. Look at, listen to the prayer. And I'm asking you to pray this prayer. If you need God to fill, fill your life with his blessing, pray this prayer. And now, God, do it again. Bring rain to our drought-stricken lives so that those who planted the crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest. You see what happens? God wants to send rain so there's going to be a harvest. But in order for there to be a harvest... Somebody had to plow up the field and somebody had to plant the seed. They did what only they could do so that God could do what only he could do. My friends, 1,113 days from today will be a celebration of faith. The evidence will come after our obedience. But God is calling each and every one of us to dig a ditch. To dig a ditch in a community of faith through service. That's why we've been asking to fill out the shape forms. So that you can dig a ditch in service. 
If you haven't done that, please pick one of those up and fill them out. But let's just talk about you right now. Where do you need to dig a ditch? So that you can do what you can do, so that God can do what only He can do. Heavenly Dad, we want the miracle. We want it instantaneously, and we want it effortlessly. And sometimes you do that. But most of the time you say, here's a shovel, dig a ditch. God, I believe with absolute certainty that you have spoken and you have spoken with clarity in these moments. We need to dig some ditches. And it's not going to feel like we're getting any results and we're not going to see the breeze come, feel the breeze come through and we're not going to see the rain clouds pour over, but your promise to us is do what you can do so that I can do what only I can do. And God, you're the God who restores, who redeems, who heals, who takes broken marriages and puts them back together, helps moms and dads to parent their children the way we're supposed to, who, who provides finances in ways we can't even imagine. Now, you're the God who does all of those things, but, but we have to dig a ditch. So God, my prayer is for the one who just today for the first time realized that they had to go dig a ditch, that they'd, that they'd do what they can do. God, I pray also for the one who's been digging a ditch for a long time. God, they've known this truth. They've been loving their wife and there's been no movement. They've been loving their husband. There's been no movement. They, they've been given faithfully and you haven't yet just blessed them, God. And, and, but they just keep digging the ditch. They keep digging the ditch. They keep digging the ditch. God, may they hold on to your promise to not grow weary in well-doing because in due season, God, our prayer is that you will do it again in each of our lives like you did it that day. That the next morning we'll wake up and there it is. God, we trust you for that. Friends, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask every one of you listening, whether you're watching online or you're watching a television set or you're in one of our local venues, that you would respond today. You have communication cards. If you're in one of our local venues, you can send us an electronic email. You can respond off the church app. I'm asking every person that's listening to the sound of my voice right now that you would respond. I want to know how I can pray for you. Where is it that you need God to act? I want to join you in prayer for that. And I also want to know what ditch has God called you to dig? And if you're not sure... Here's a challenge for you. At Miami Valley Community Church, my promise to you is we've got a shovel that will fit your hands because you've been shaped to serve. Here's what I've discovered in my life. When God asks me to dig a ditch, it's never singular. It's always plural. Fill this valley with ditches. So I've got a hunch God's asking you to do a couple things. For some of you, it's just pray. You just need to start digging a ditch in prayer that your children will return to God, that you'd honor God. I don't know where is it. You need to intercede. You need to invest. You need to invite. My harpist is going to continue to play. I'm going to be done, and I'm going to walk off the stage. My pastoral staff will be down front, and they would love to talk with you. Would you be sensitive to those people around you that are still doing business with God? When you know the ditches that you've been called to dig, and you're willing to share those, you're dismissed. Almighty God, You've got a shovel that will fit our hands. Now it's time to dig some ditches. God, we anticipate and we expect you to do the miraculous. But we have to participate with you in your work. So Heavenly Father, continue to speak to our hearts. Help us not to grow weary in well-doing. Help us to do what we can do and trust you to do what only you can do. There's somebody that's listening right now that's never asked Jesus to be their Savior. And you need to do that today. Would you pray a prayer like this? Heavenly Father, I, I don't understand it all, and it doesn't make logical sense. But by faith, I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe he lived a life of perfection and died a death on a cross. I believe that he rose from the dead. 
And today I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that he raised from the dead. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. If you prayed a prayer like that today, would you let us know that on your card as well? Now, Heavenly Dad, as we go from this place, we go excited about what you're going to do and eager to dig the ditch that you've called us to dig. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God love you. We'll see you next week.